So without further ado, um, Ed, thank you again for being here with um, Ed with Cal Fire, and um, uh, feel free to. Um, sorry, I, I know that there's a um, a screen share setting that I need to. Great, there we go. Um, Ed, you're free to share your screen. You're free to uh, not share, and I can just share your your materials. But um, please take it away. Thank you, Tom. Um, so, yeah, again, uh, Ed Ori, I'm the unit forester in the Santa Clara unit of CAL FIRE. And the Santa Clara unit actually covers all of Santa Clara County, Alameda, and Contra Costa County, and then the western portion of Stanislaus and San Joaquin. So that's our area. And I have counterparts in uh, other adjacent CAL FIRE units that are probably some of your go to contacts. But um, uh, Tom, you, you pretty well covered it, so I could do a, uh, you're explaining what a fuel break, is, a shaded fuel break is, so I could do a mic drop right now and leave it at that, but um, I, um, I'd like to add a little bit to that, and, uh, but I'd like to start out with some philosophical uh, discussion first uh, as a preamble to fuel breaks. Um, I don't have any slides, and um, I just didn't have time this week. There's just uh, too much going on right now. So uh, I, I did, uh, as you mentioned, uh, provide some documents that I think everybody will probably find useful for, uh, for your own needs and uh, encourage you to take a look at those. But um, I'll, I'll talk about uh, shaded fuel breaks from the CAL FIRE perspective but I'll be interjecting some of my own experiences and philosophies as well. Um, I wanna make sure that you have a, a big picture, the 40,000 foot view of uh, fuel breaks in, in general, because some of you are decision makers and some of you will hopefully become decision makers in the future and uh, be involved with uh, some of the development uh, of fuel treatment projects. And um, I don't want you to be myopic on whatever specialty you have. If you're a biologist or an archeologist or, or have some other specialty that you, you consider the, the entire landscape. Um, and it's also important because sometimes you need to adv advise or educate your boss or your uh, constituents, the public, et, et cetera. Um, I'd like to start out with one of the sayings I use often is life is full of choices. But I, I recently found a, a much better way of saying that from the economist uh, uh, Thomas uh, Sowell, who said, there are no solutions, there are only trade-offs. And you try to get the best trade-off you can, that's all you can hope for. We cannot achieve a perfect outcome. And you all know that there isn't any silver bullet to um, fire prevention. So um, fuel breaks, shaded fuel breaks or otherwise, are just one tool in the toolbox that, um, as you were discussing earlier, there is research and literature that have proven the effectiveness of them. So um, they're a valuable tool. And re remember that not everybody is going to be happy with your choices or your project design. Um, there's always going to be some level of conflict. And that conflict uh, usually results in paralysis. Uh, take, for example, um, CAL FIRE has a long history of doing prescribed burns. We did it for decades and decades, and then we dwindled down to almost nothing. Uh, and that's just because of the bureaucracy, the regulations, the uh, public will, the cost, you know, there's a number of reasons for it. And same thing with uh, fuel treatment. And, and it's just easier sometimes to do nothing. But um, that's really how we got to where we are is because we, we stopped doing active management. Um, and, and that's why we're looking to um, Native American practices because they took an active role in, in the management of their landscapes. 
and we just stopped doing that or we started focusing on one little issue and not looking at the bigger picture so sometimes we we just have to um accept the fact that uh, not everybody is going to be on board and, and i'll talk more about that in a little bit but um when i graduated from college at humboldt back in the early 80s there was a huge conflict um there was dislike distrust between the public timber companies agencies ngos nobody got along and um that that was on a statewide and national wide level and fortunately things have calmed down but you still have that on any given project where there there could be somebody that um, is really against an aspect of what what you want to do and um, you, you need to be able to uh, to deal with that and and try to find a successful outcome um, th there's always going to be uh, the nimbys and um, uh, people with denial that um, this project isn't necessary in their area. It doesn't pertain to them, or they have a short memory. They forgot that uh, the tunnel fire just wiped out their entire neighborhood where they live um, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Um, so, you know, you have to re remind people that, yeah, it does apply to you and that there is a history. And history does repeat itself. Um, some of the examples of, of recent controversy are, are like over eucalyptus uh, removal. There's there's groups, there's people who think eucalyptus has a bad rap, and then there's other people that say no, the science says. And um, you have to educate yourself on on what those issues are. Uh, sometimes we have to educate public agencies, even like Cal Fish and Wildlife, on their responsibility to manage Alameda whip snake. You know, uh, there are um, consultants and agencies who have uh, done a lot of research on uh, habitat protection, species protections, and need to share your success stories uh, with those agency decision decision makers. Um, there's always controversy about cutting large trees. Um, there, there's people who, who feel that uh, we need to maximize carbon sequestration, but how do you do that and still cut brush and trees to provide a shaded fuel break? Um, there's controversy between providing early seral habitat for species dependent on that versus old growth. I mean, those are, you can't provide everything on every acre, but those are things that, that we can accommodate on the landscape. And then um, fire hazard reduction work. There, there's always gonna be some conflict uh, over aesthetics or noise or traffic control. You know, if you make people late for work because of your traffic control, you're gonna hear about it. Um, or people who are sensitive to smoke legitimately um, because of a prescribed burn. So compromise is obviously required. Um, and, um, and every project will, will have to defend itself on its own merits. How do, how do we fix this? Um, you know, you can't just take the attitude, oh, well, we just need to educate them. Well, sometimes people, their, their minds are made up. Um, you can have laws, rules, ordinances, like um, Public Resources Code 4291 says you will clean the, or you will treat the vegetation around your house in a 30-foot circle, 100-foot circle, etc. cetera. Um, Sometimes people don't want to be told what to do on their land. Um, sometimes court cases will have determinations that um, will, will affect uh, outcomes. And then there, there's policy that we get from agencies or you get from or legislation. 
etc. So all of these things you, you have to work with them. Um, in planning and designing a project, uh, the first thing you have to do is determine what are your goals and and think about them as multiple goals. Um, don't be myopic in that either. You, you want to, of course, in the context of this discussion, reduce the fuel loading, the fire hazard, but there's going to be other co-benefits that should be part of your goals, like improving habitat or um, improving aesthetics. Um, look, look to find out what those are. And then, of course, you have to know what are the rules and laws that, that pertain. Uh, do you need a, a tree cutting permit from the county? Or are you subject to the forest practice rules that CAL FIRE maintains? Or any other rules or your own internal, if you're a land manager, you're going to have policies that uh, guide what you can and can't do. And then outside, um, Look at the issues and concerns that um, your neighbors, the public, etc., have, whether they're real or um, per their perception. Um, and perception is often reality. Um, and then uh, I encourage you to uh, develop a range of options, just like in the CEQA process. You have to develop options. Uh, same thing with your, your uh, scope of work. Try to um, start out with um, a wider range of options than what you have to do for CEQA, where you um, literally go from a do nothing to a, a, the most aggressive possible treatment. And then um, be able to explain and develop some empathy with with the public or or your supervisors, what what the full range of options really are like, um, and I don't mean fleshing it out in in a big document, but I mean it, it explain. Um, but be careful that whatever compromise you come up with um, is not going to lead to an ineffectual outcome. So like. In a fuel break we had a, a couple of years ago, um, we were not able to build the fuel break as planned through an area of uh, some sensitive habitat. And so there was a compromise where instead of one big wide fuel break, we ended up with two parallel smaller fuel breaks uh, in close proximity that went through the same habitat. Well, I would argue that that was kind of a waste of time because um, the width of, of individual fuel breaks really didn't get the kind of protection that, that you thought you were getting. And so don't fool yourself, don't fool the public about um, what you think you can achieve. Um, they're, they're not the same. Um, uh, so let me get into a little bit more of the, the meat of fuel breaks. I'll get off my editorial stump here a little bit. Um, a shaded fuel break is um, a fuel break that is developed in a um, tree dominated landscape uh, where you have trees to create the shade as opposed to um, where there's not trees, you're, you're just thinning out brush. But a fuel break is not the same as a fire line. So when we fight fires, we build boxes. We, we contain the fire, we create a fire line around the perimeter to, to hold that fire in. And, and a fire line is a cleared area down the mineral soil. And uh, it's intended to out and out stop that fire even considering uh, firebrands, embers blowing across. Now, if, if the fire jumps the line uh, because of radiant heat or firebrands, then we'll back off, go to the next ridge, the next creek, the next road, whatever that provides a, 
a strategic advantage and build another one. And typically when we have to do that, um, we build a bigger, wider fuel break that um, we're, we're more confident in, in the fact that it'll, it'll hold that fire. Uh, so we use the, the same sort of a philosophy in fuel breaks that you're building boxes to contain a hypothetical fire sometime in the future. And so um, having a, a series of boxes will hopefully compartmentalize any fire that develops. But remember that a fuel break is, is different in that you're speculating that there's gonna be a fire. So if, if you have a, a history of a lot of fires in an area, then there's a good chance that there's gonna be another fire in that area in the future. Like, like I said, history repeats, but it's still speculative. Um, you don't know that there's going to be a fire there in the future. Uh, case in point, uh, in the Santa Cruz Mountains, there was a um, series, a system of fuel breaks that was started um, many decades ago as part of a federal program called um, uh, Public Law 83-566. Uh, we call it PL-566 for short. Um, but it was intended to break that um, fire flood cycle. And for decades, these fuel breaks were built and maintained. And about uh, 20, 2014, um, that whole project collapsed um, for a number of reasons. But two years later, the fire that everybody predicted and planned for finally came. <laughs> Fortunately, the fuel brakes were, still had some effectiveness and um, they were fully utilized. So when, when you're dealing with regulatory agencies, sometimes you get pushback saying, well, you're doing a discretionary project. There's no guarantee that there's going to be a fire here. Why are you going so aggressive? And you have to be able to defend that. Um, the advantages of a, a, a shaded fuel break over a wildfire is that um, you're, you're doing the project proactively. You're doing it at a time and place of your convenience where you can consider other values. You can have uh, monitors on site to protect all the resources that are there. Um, you can avoid some controversy, but when there is a wildfire, uh, we oftentimes um, build some contingency lines. It's not that we don't trust. Uh, it is because we don't trust our initial fire line. <laughs> we we, we want to prepare so that if, if a fire does jump the line, that we can catch it at, at another point. Um, and the decisions are actually pretty simple. You literally tell a dozer operator, start here, go to there, and, and I'll bring you lunch later on. And um, there are no biological monitors. There are no permits. There's no CEQA. There's no anything. It's just you have a fire that is coming at you, and, and you go do it. But, um, but there's sacrifices. And so if we can uh, proactively um, develop these fuel breaks ahead of time, then um, hopefully we are saving a greater good by all the acres that would have been lost otherwise. So um, let me take a minute to um, talk about some of the, the purposes of a, of a fuel break. Um, because I think you'll find that it, it's a little bit more than um, just catching a fire. Um, Fuel breaks are, are not intended to stop a fire, although they, they can. It would be great if, if you could develop a fuel break and then a fire starts and burns up to it unattended. No firefighters there. The fire just burns up to the edge of that fuel break and just goes out. Um, and I think 
that's really the, the point we should have for protecting your homes with that defensible space. But um, that's not always the case. Um, typically, the, the fuel break is to diminish the risk or the rate of spread of a fuel break. So it just slows it down. Um, they provide access and travel routes for firefighters to um, get to the fire line. It, it provides them a safe place to work um, in the short term so that they can um, effectively increase the, the width and, and quality of a fuel break. It, it allows them to do their additional work much quicker and much more efficiently. Um, a fuel break also, because there's less vegetation there, it makes the aerial retardant that is often used go a lot farther. There's less vegetation to cover. Um, it's not obstructed by uh, various horizontal layers intercepting the, the retardant. So you get a much better coverage. Um, fuel breaks um, provide the opportunity for um, uh, backfiring and burnout operations so that as the fire is coming to it, we, we can light fires at the edge of a fuel break and allow it to burn into the main fire. And those fires that we light start out with a low intensity and gradually increase and so minimizes the impacts of the fire and, and some of the area that would have otherwise been consumed. Um, and then fuel breaks, um, if they're not for necessarily stopping a fire, they, they can uh, provide a um, tenable environment for the public to evacuate through. So like along a roadway that may not have strategic value for stopping a fire or controlling a fire, but it, it's the road that a neighborhood or a community needs to escape from where, like you saw in the campfire videos, I'm sure, um, people, people died in their cars on the road trying to escape. You know, there might have been a tree that fell down in the road or a vehicle that was disabled and people couldn't escape and they, they couldn't survive in the roadway. So the fuel treatment along the road can be extremely beneficial for creating short term, like a temp temporary refuge area, a, a tenable habitat, ten tenable environment. <laughs> um, and then some collateral benefits of a fuel break um, can be aesthetically appealing. You know, they can have a rather park like environment that some people really like. Um, you can be improving habitat for certain species of flora that, especially those that are shade intolerant or um, um, uh, don't tolerate competition. And similarly, it, it can improve habitat for um, select species of fauna like goshawks and others that, that need a little bit more open environment uh, uh, to hunt or their prey base. Um, you can um, improve or reduce rather impacts to cultural sites because um, you're, you're carefully working around them to protect those. Um, I've found that um, roadside shaded fuel breaks can, can be very beneficial for protecting wildlife and, and avoiding conflicts with traffic. Um, so if, if you're speeding down the highway, uh, deer and other wildlife can see vehicles coming and vice versa so that um, there isn't any sudden surprises to either party. Um, it, it can provide uh, safety for pedestrians. You know, you can't always walk alongside of a road, but if you can parallel the road, Having an open environment for, for travel, hiking, biking, et cetera, is uh, much more enjoyable, safer, et cetera. 
And then another collateral benefit is um, when, when you have the big storm years like we just um, experienced. Um, typically when you're doing the, the fuel break work, you're taking out the weak trees, the, the poor performers, the snags, the trees that would otherwise be falling into the road, falling on the power lines, phone lines, et cetera, or trees that come off the cut bank and um, take with it a, a big chunk of the, the hillside and create um, a low spot where water ponds and then you have a little mini debris slide that ends up in the road blocking the road. And, and so uh, you're avoiding some of those impacts. But there can also be disadvantages uh, and hopefully you can mitigate for some of those like uh, loss of habitat for some other species of flora or fauna. You can be uh, creating habitat for invasive species, uh, grasses, um, broom notably, um, that, that are going to come in. You know, ground disturbing activities in general will really promote the invasive uh, plants. So that, that's, that's a key one to watch out for. Um, also by opening up, a vegetative area, you you can be exposing a cultural site, a historic site or a prehistoric Native American site that then in turn gets looted or vandalized by, by the public. So you wanna be very careful about that because remember once you cut vegetation, you cannot put it back. Um, there's also the potential for increased erosion if you're exposing too much soil or removing too much vegetation or duff so that the raindrop impact is gonna begin that um, um, reeling and gulling process. You wanna avoid that. Um, and then um, think about future maintenance too, because uh, you may be setting yourself up for um, uh, doing maintenance in, in a completely different vegetative type and, and having other consequences, like the example I gave where if, if you uh, disturb the ground, you bring in the broom, now you're in a situation where you have to pull or, or spray or cut repeatedly the, the broom, and uh, you're creating a, a bigger workload for yourself. So um, there's a lot of things to weigh. Um, let me give you a, a few other factors in, in your design. When you start out by planning a, a fuel break, you, you need to have an anchor. You, you don't just go out on a section of a ridge and say, well, I'm gonna go from here to there. It, you need to have an anchor point, whether it's uh, a natural opening, a previous fuel treatment or something so that the fire doesn't simply just burn around the end of your, your, um, the end of your fuel break. Um, let's see, um, thinking about the location, um, sometimes a fuel break can't be constructed in an ideal location like that ridge top. Um, you oftentimes have to um, integrate a road that may not be in an ideal location as really being the foundation for your fuel break. And so, um, uh, yes, use the road, but there's, there's uh, like uh, nooks and crannies and dips and bends in the road that you might need to widen out or extend up to a ridge top or um, build upon that to think about the end result, the, the effectiveness. Um, remember that when you build a, a fuel break to stop a fire, that you are, are 
basically designing it for a certain set of criteria. Like uh, it might be a, a wind speed of 20 to 30 miles an hour that you think that the, that width, that treatment, that intensity of treatment will, will protect you from embers going across the line. Well, what happens when you have a 45 or 60 or 90 mile an hour um, wind event? All bets are off. Your, your fuel break will help, but it won't achieve its goal. And so when you're, you're talking to the public or your supervisors or anyone else, your constituents, uh, be sure to not promise that that fuel break will guarantee you stop a fire because it, it will not, and it cannot. And certainly over time, the, the effectiveness will diminish, but um, there's, there's just, there's design limits on your fuel break. Just like with anything else, uh, seat belts, for example, you know, they work great up to a certain speed, but if you're doing 90 miles an hour down a freeway and hit a, a brick wall, um, I'm sorry, that seatbelt really isn't going to make any difference. Um, see, I, I mentioned some um, indirect uh, indirect impacts uh, of a fuel break, like exposing arc sites. Um, or we think about um, later on, you may uh, only have the money to uh, build a fuel break of a certain width or certain intensity, but later on, you want to expand upon that. So uh, consider that in your initial design because when, when you do come back later on to say, extend the width of a treatment area, you're gonna be dragging material or running equipment through the area that you already treated so you are going to have more impacts in that second treatment area than, than just that treatment area. Um, let's see, um, some other considerations are um, when you build the fuel break, are you going to do it in stages or phases? So a phase would be like from point A to point B this year, the next year you do point B to point C, et cetera, or possibly stage it. So one stage would be going through dealing with the trees. The second stage would be going through and treating the brush and the understory. Um, and, and that may be because of, um, funding limitations or um, workforce availability or any number of things. Um, Ed, I wanna um, jump in real quick and just um, uh, uh, mention that we wanna have time for some questions, but this has been absolutely excellent. Do you mind um, wrapping up here pretty soon so we can uh, yep. pepper you with some questions? I will. And, and the last thing is uh, consider what's feasible versus what's practical. So if, if you had a, an army of ants to go out there, uh, you know, uh, tens of thousands of people, you could do anything, but you always have the realities of um, cost constraints, time constraints, um, personnel, staffing, contractor availability, um, public inconveniences, all of those sorts of things. So um, sometimes you have to compromise your standards based on the, the practical, practicality of, of what it is you want to do. Um, that's basically it. I, uh, like I said, I provided Tom with a whole bunch of documents that um, pertain to Cal Fire's perspective. I sent uh, some documents about the Highway 17 fuel break, the North Arena Shaded fuel break, some success stories. Um, I did include a couple of research documents. You know, we started this um, conversation with research documents, but sometimes those are, are very, very, very specific to a, 
uh, a vegetative type or location or something like that. Um, they don't always have transportability to other environments or other, other areas in general. So um, I tried to um, minimize the amount, but I, I've got a huge amount of documents. I'm happy to share that if, if uh, you want to do that. But I think the ones I sent are, are probably the be the most valuable to start with. Excellent. Thank you so much, Ed. Um, let's go right into questions and um, and then we'll transition to some discussion. Um, uh, I'd love to hear folks um, in your questions for Ed. Maybe let's start with um, questions that you may have to sort of clarify or um, uh, direct questions for Ed. Um, do, because of his expertise and position. Um, but uh, we also want to hear from members of the working group who have uh, experience with fuel um, fuel breaks, um, whether you are funding fuel breaks or you're in, establishing fuel breaks yourself or your contractors are. But let's start with um, direct questions for Ed um, based on his, uh, his message and his position. Oh, Stu, do you want to start us off? Yeah, well, first, Ed, thank you for sharing what's obviously like decades worth of experience in this. Mm -hmm. I just really appreciate hearing that. So um, I have two questions. One is, is there a good map of fuel breaks with, you know, ancillary information, like when was it put in? How wide is it? Because um, uh, I'm the science advisor to the Conservation Lands Network, and I think it would just be a fantastic layer to have in as across as much of the Bay Area as possible. And my second question is budgeting, budgeting in the maintenance. You know, you touched on that a little bit um, because, yeah, you know, the broom's going to come in in a lot of places. and that's going to destroy your fuel break in, you know, five years. So I'm um, just curious about when you're budgeting to put in a fuel break, is the maintenance in addition to the like an initial capital costs taken into account? Okay, so your, your first question about fuel breaks, um, on, on every wildfire that we have fought, everyone has fought, um, there were fire lines constructed. And um, if, if you have maps of those old fires, uh, it'll show where the location of, of those fire lines were constructed. And interestingly enough, a couple of years ago, two years ago, I guess, may, maybe it was in 2020, um, there, there was a, a memo we got from Sacramento that said, hey, do you think maybe um, you, you might want to um, submit some of those um, fire lines into a, like a greater database, geospatial database, so that um, we can um, uh, maybe select those for future funding? Uh, and and try to uh, maintain those over time. Obviously, not all of them, and and uh, some of them were were really built in haste and maybe not the best location, but it was the best location at that time to fight the fire. Um, so, um, the location of those fire lines in the past uh, would be a good place to start if you can get your hands on on some of those maps. The in, in recent years now, we have um, uh, all the, the data preserved from, from those fire lines, from those fires. So um, start with that. And um, maybe um, start early and, and start getting a landowner permission. Um, CEQA wasn't needed when they were built, but if, moving forward, CEQA does pertain. So get a start on that. Regarding the, the funding, like many of you may have been involved with uh, grant funded activities that provided for the construction of a fuel break. 
but those funds don't always cover maintenance. The CAL FIRE wildfire prevention grants can um, be used for maintenance. However, we're always trying to get the most bang for the buck with our grant money and try to help entities do that heavy lift of constructing a, a fuel break from scratch. Um, typically the maintenance, it, if it starts on early and on time, um, the maintenance costs should not be nearly what the construction costs were, unless you wait too long and then you are basically starting over. Uh, we, we tend to favor in the grant process entities that say, we need help building this fuel line, but we will take it from here. Like in the case of North Orinda, the Marauder in the fire department, um, they have said repeatedly that uh, we need help with building these fuel breaks, but we will maintain it in the future with prescribed herbivory grazing and prescribed fire. And that, that's great uh, because they, they have the wherewithal to do that. Thank you for sharing that, Ed. We've got another uh, question here from Ann Crelock with the Marin Wildfire Prevention Authority. Um, uh, she's wondering if you could share your approach regarding width of linear shaded fuel breaks. Some of the documents that I provided um, have some, some uh, good specifications on that. But um, I would caution you that those are really just a guide. So on flat ground, um, in a given vegetative type, you can get by with one width, but if the slope increases, you need to go wider. Uh, one of the documents I submitted to you was um, from the NRCS, where they give some guidelines for fuel break construction, and they talk about um, uh, compensating for slope and, and um, separation of vegetation, um, trees versus brush, et cetera. Again, those, those are just guidelines. And um, if you're able to use a, a fire spread model, that can certainly help a lot. But um, think, think of it this way. When, when um, we're fighting a fire, we have to periodically create um, either a safety zone or a temporary refuge zone for our firefighters. We don't want to extend them out on the fire line too far and then run the risk of them getting cut off, trapped, burned over, killed, et cetera. So they periodically need to have somewhere to escape to if, if the wind suddenly changes, conditions change, what have you. You get a thunderstorm come in with a downburst of air, all hell could break loose. So need to have um, refuge areas. We have formulas that will calculate um, what the minimum, um, area for a shelter deployment zone or a TRA would be. Uh, a safety zone, by the way, is an area that you should be able to go to without having to have a fire shelter or any supporting protective equipment. It's, it's, it's a large area, especially if you're in a forested timber area. But um, a shelter deployment site you know, um, a person is 32 square feet and, and twice the height of the flame length is what your buffer is and so forth. Um, you know, that, that's a guide for saving people. Um, think of those concepts with, with a fuel break as well. And if, if you're in a chimney, like a, a draw or uh, an area that wind funnels through or would naturally provide a... a a convective route for fire, you're gonna need more area. Um, I would encourage all of you to, um, to take a class. You can do it self-paced. All firefighters have to take this. It's called uh, S190 and then there's S290 and then S390, but I would encourage you to take 190 and 290. So firefighters have to have it for, um, their own survival, their own heads up information. It, it, it's a class that talks about fuels, weather, and topography and how they interact in fire behavior. So 
yeah, it's important to understand those concepts when you're fighting a fire, but it's also important when, when you're um, designing a fuel break or, um, or defensible space around your house. And um, the NWCG has those classes. 190 I know is self-paced online. I believe 290 is as well. Ed, thank you for, the, for that. I've got um, two more direct questions for you, and then and then I'm going to open up to the group for um, just sharing uh, their experiences with shaded field breaks. Uh, Kim Batchelder with uh, Sonoma County Ag and Open Space is asking, um, uh, do you think Cal Fire will will uh, lean toward uh, uh, potential operational delineations pods to help link the shaded field breaks? What are your thoughts on that? Uh... We're, we're working on it. Um, the first step is um, Cal Fire has a program called CalMapper, where it's a geospatial database to keep track of, uh, of what projects we're doing where, what the CEQA was, who the funder was, who the, you know, everything about that project um, on the landscape. And that will allow you to see what's been done where, but more importantly, it, it it tells you, shows you where the gaps are um, and helps keep in mind what you did that you might need to come back and do maintenance on. There is a public facing version of Cal Fire, uh, Cal Mapper uh, that has um, uh, been released. I don't have the website. Um, I'm trying to remember what it's called. I, I'll have to look it up. I can send you the link. But um, there is another MOU that was recently developed that goes beyond CalMapper. So CalMapper is really anything, everything that Cal Fire is involved with. But this other MOU, mainly for no far northern Northern California, um, it uh, has all the agency projects, the timber company projects. Uh, local jurisdictions, it's much more comprehensive, but the, um, the data may not be as robust uh, yeah. about individual projects. It's, it's more um, visual. But, but that, I think, is the first step, is mm -hmm. keeping track of what's been done, and then we, we can expand upon that, see where the gaps are moving forward. Great. Thank you, Ed. Uh, one more question for you. Um, uh, first, some thanks for your genuine and realistic insight. Um, could you speak to the effectiveness of shaded field breaks designed for high wind, uh, you know, 60 miles an hour plus, and how this might change um, with uh, heavy um, versus brushy fuel types? Heavy fuel types versus brushy fuel types. Um. Well, a, a, sh a, shaded view, uh, a shaded fuel break has the advantages of um, moderating the, the fire weather environment uh, in that area where the, the shade will help reduce the temperature, increase the humidity on the forest floor under those trees. And if you didn't have those trees, it'd be hotter, drier and, and um, also um, more um, early seral or, or shade intolerant plants are, are going to fill that in because nature abhors a vacuum. But it, uh, the shaded fuel break will hopefully shade out some of the competing vegetation that would otherwise come back and, and moderate the, the temperatures. Um, I, was, I was in a really interesting conversation a couple of years ago and and Carol Rice is going to roll her eyes here in a minute. But uh, I was asked to look at some um, eucalyptus stands up by Grizzly Peak Road. And there's one land manager up there that um, doesn't want to aggressively remove the eucalyptus. They want to deal with it through attrition, whereas other people that were there want all the eucalyptus taken out. And um, there are some really interesting um, coalitions that developed around that where even the Sierra Club was, yeah, the eucalyptus need to, needs to go. 
And uh, in the conversation, I, I, I did have to point out that, you know, these, these eucalyptus trees that are kind of scattered up there, they, they do have the effect of being a physical block to intercept some of those embers that are going to come flying over the, the ridgetop uh, from phone winds, offshore winds. And, um, and, and the same thing around your home, um, having trees there will intercept a percentage of the embers that blow by. And frankly, most homes burn to the ground because of, of ember cast. Um, it's not the, the fire front that comes up and gobbles up everything in front of it. it the fire's leapfrog. Uh, the embers land uh, well out ahead of the main fire, start little fires, it all burns together, and the, you know, that process repeats. And, mm -hmm. and so if you're able to stop some of that ember cast, you're, you are slowing down the, the spread of the, of the fire. So that, I mean, that, that's a concept. Mm -hmm. that has merit in some situations. Thank you very much for uh, uh, answering those questions, Ed. I'm going to pivot now to um, the working group. And if I may, um, Susie um, uh, Petri from Peninsula Open Space Trust has, has been a, an active um, member of a team who's uh, you know, established a shaded field break in San Vicente Redwoods. And, Susie, can I, um, I, you know, full transparency, I got, we got in touch before this, so um, you're sort of primed to um, maybe share with the group, but I'm going to um, uh, ask you if you wouldn't mind sharing your, you know, lessons learned with uh, San Vicente. Absolutely, glad, glad to um, share some of the things that um, we've been doing out at San Vicente Redwoods down near Santa Cruz. Um, I also just put a, a link in the chat. If you are curious and want more details, Nadia Haney, um, Joe Christie, who's with the Bonnie Dune Fire Safe Council, um, <clears throat> and Sebastian Holmes, who is a contractor who helped implement some of this work, um, were in, were, um, had a presentation a few weeks ago um, talking about some of this work. So I'm just sort of riffing off of um, uh, Nadia's presentation here, um, sharing her slides. Um, I just want to introduce the property where some of this work was happening. Um, it's about a 9,000 acre redwood property um, with, um, it has more than redwoods. There's kind of a diverse forest system, um, but we, we, the redwoods are, you know, kind of the, the heart of the property. Um, so one of the things that um, I wanted to just touch base on or emphasize for you guys was, I think it's really critical to include any um, fuel break locations that you're proposing in any regional planning efforts in order to get funding. So um, Nadia participated in a, um, a stakeholder group meeting in 2010 um, to make sure that San Vicente Redwoods, which is kind of circled in, in black here, was um, identified as um, important critical spots for um, fuel reduction work in our um, community wildfire protection plan. Um, so these um, ridge line, these fuel breaks were identified based on ridge lines, um, topography, and also adjacency to roads. Um, so there's a lot of slides here. Uh, we had a, a vegetation management plan, which we used as our um, CEQA document to do our prescribed burns in the empire grade fuel area and along um, Warrenella. War, um, empire grade is a pretty primary road um, that runs just right here. Um, and then Warrenella is a private road that runs through our property down to Highway 1. Um, so I just wanted to kind of, like um, Ed was so well saying, um, that it's really critical to not have just fuel breaks that stop and start at certain points, um, really need to have like a network and an anchor point. So um, here's the Empire grade fuel break um, that we have been working on, um, Ridgeline fuel breaks as well along these areas. Um, we also worked with um, UC Berkeley, Scott Stevens, um, and AMLT to do some um, monitoring in these areas to understand how the vegetation was responding to, um, to the treatments that we did. Um, we did prescribed burns in addition to the ladder fuel removal, um, had some great success. And then we actually had a wildfire about six months after that prescribed burn, um, which burned through the property at various intensities. And I know we're over time, so I'll just show the fun picture that I like talking about. Um, is a, here, here's a picture, this is taken just a few days after the wildfire. Um, and you can see this artificially straight line here. 
Um, that is actually the road that we used um, to contain our prescribed burn with Cal Fire here. So this, the CZU fire, um, you know, hit 86,000 acres um, and burned really um, at a high intensity um, and from various different spots. So this prescribed, or this uh, fuel break area was actually hit from two with two different fires in the same fire complex. Um, and it persisted that fuel, the latter fuel reduction actually allowed these trees to maintain their canopy. Um, and you can go today and see that difference. Um, right now, this is the new parking lot we put in um, open last December. There are live trees side by side with dead trees with a trail running in the middle. And that's because that was our prescribed burn line. So um, we're doing a lot more um, fuel reduction work um, ongoing. Um, in fact, Empire Grade is getting a refresh right now thanks to funding from Cal Fire and implementation by the Bonnie and Fire Safe Council. Um, so there's a lot of a lot of work thinking about a matrix to make sure that we're creating containers where we can have future prescribed burns to reduce fuel loads uh, later on. But we're we still are a long ways to go um, to prepare for that because of all the dead trees left over from the 2020 fire. Hmm. And that's it. Susie, thank you so much. That was a that was a great lightning talk. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, questions for Susie. Just want to make sure that. If anything came up. Yeah, I want to just promote the, the link. Nadia Haney explains it much better than I do. So if you have time to jump in there, um, it's it's worth a watch for sure. <laughs> Any other um, quick thoughts to share? Uh, anecdotes from your own work? This is uh, Anne Krelock. I wasn't here for introductions, but uh, thanks so much. Uh, Ed, for speaking today. It was really interesting to hear your perspective. Um, I'll just join by saying, you know, we had a, an ignition last week right next to a shaded fuel break that we had, um, we're implementing now. It's a 38 mile long shaded fuel break. And uh, the fire, you know, it wasn't extreme conditions. It was pretty chill conditions. Um, but uh, the fire did fizzle out as soon as it hit the shaded fuel break. So that was a nice um, success story for us. And then, you know, I think there's something to to consider, which is, you know, what conditions you're designing your shaded fuel break for. It, it may be that under the tubs and nuns scenario, a shaded fuel break isn't going to be particularly useful. But under 95% of the, you know, weather conditions that we experience, then it can make a really big difference. So just a, a thought to leave with. Thanks, everybody. And thanks, Susie. That was great. Yeah, indeed. Thanks, Anne. Thank um, I, Ed, I just want to um, add my thanks um, uh, on behalf of everybody. Uh, that was really wonderful, and um, we'll be we recorded this, and we'll put this up. <laughs> Hopefully, everybody got some ideas out of this. Absolutely, I love it. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you soon. <laughs>